Hello, everybody. So I brought something for you today. So this is mud. And yeah, as a person, I probably see it and I think like, oh, it's brown, sluggish, dirty. Probably life is not in there. But yeah, if I go a little bit back and choose to go from this meta perspective or this meter perspective where we operate as humans, down the tiny scales, the tiny dimensions, we see that this jar full of mud becomes a jar full of life. A jar full of wiggling tiny organisms living there, doing their best every day to survive and to enhance the world with beautiful things. And yeah, if you look at this mud, for example, we can find one species that I really, really favor, cyanobacteria. We'll probably find them as something like this. Um, this is a little bit like fluffy. In reality, they're not so fluffy, but it's very sweet and soft. Um, yeah, and you see that they build really beautiful communities. And these beautiful communities can even be seen from space sometimes. And the really cool thing is that they build two cell types, even if they're only one cellular organisms, because they are one community. So some do photosynthesis, the green ones, and some do nitrogen fixation, the big ones. And both of those processes are stuff we as chemists are very bad in. You can find those organisms everywhere. And all of them have things that I'm very interested about because they tell stories and they do things that we as chemists don't know about. So I want to introduce this micro world to you today. And I also want to show you this passion for collecting microorganisms and how we can understand them. Because how do you go about it? You go outside, you collect dirt, you come back to the laboratory, you put it onto plates, and then you look on their shapes, their color, their DNA, etc. And it's very addicting, like it's kind of collecting Pokemon. So when I go into the lab, <laughs> it's like I have my personal Pokemon collection there, and I try to understand their superpowers. Okay, and yeah, there's one favorite story of mine where it gets kind of confusing and was like, I was really annoying at that time, because I was really interested in everything. And I wanted to look at the bacteria in the Irish Sea. And as you know, Ireland is like an island, so you have to go there by plane and have to go back to Liverpool also by plane. And my water bottle like, was thrown off at the airport security control, but I didn't want to give up my bacteria. So I ran through the airport and I tried to find somebody to clear my bottle to ta be taken with me on the flight, and it actually worked. So I got my bacterial samples back to Vienna, and here you can see them growing on plates. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit confusing sometimes if you see people very, being very interested in things that we actually can't see. But yeah, that's actually me. And the thing is that when we look at bacteria, they survive everywhere, like not in the sea, but also in very hot or very cold environments, harsh conditions that we as humans probably would never inhabit. Yet. But still we can learn how we could inhabit regions, for example, that are similar to Martian conditions, etc. And also how we can produce things from dirt, like bacteria. So bacteria are actual superheroes. And why is that? The underlying thing there is code. Like every organism, they also have DNA in them. Um, we as humans have our DNA bundled up in X-shaped chromosomes in our cells, nuclei. So you could say we are not only meta-humans, but also X-men. It's my favorite analogy. Um, but bacteria have one cooler thing. They have everything not condensed in multiple chromosomes, but one chromosome. And through evolution, it formed one loop for them. So they have one ring to rule them all, which is also quite a nice analogy if you like Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, so this chromosome has different parts and regions. Some regions turn different regions on and off. Some are for protection, some are for multiplication of the bacterial cells so that they can grow and divide, etc. And the favorite regions of everybody or every living organism are the ones that we call genes. Because those genes carry all the information of how to build an organism. And in each living cell, this information of how to build an organism is transcribed into instructions. And the instructions are what we know as mRNA, and we will know more of the mRNA because of the last years. Essentially, mRNA is kind of a wiggly thing that can go into a cell, and in the cell it meets a machinery. Those machineries are ribosomes, and those complex ribosomes can then take amino acids from the cell, locate them together, and link them chemically to form a long chain of amino acids. So each sequence of amino acids is specific for each gene. Or in other words, each gene gives us one specific sequence of amino acids. And then my favorite thing happens. So the cell does some origami. In a sense, it folds this long chain of amino acids into a 3D shape. And in design, we often say form follows function. And here in biology, it actually is the other way around. So function follows form. The specific form of a protein gives it a specific function. And this specific function of many proteins are to lower the activation energy of chemical reactions. Because if you find 
genes that make proteins that lower the activation energy of chemical reactions, you can be a much faster, a much better chemist, and do much more different reactions in a very single tiny space. And bacteria can do that especially good. And through evolution, therefore, bacteria have become masters at producing and evolving genes that make very cool proteins doing stuff that we humans can only think about. For example, they can make radioactive waste less harmful, or they can break down plastics, or they can take stuff from the air like nitrogen fixation and make fertilizer from it. Stuff that we as humans don't breathe in, breathe out, do nothing with. So when we look at this, we can say that bacteria essentially have survival in their genes. They are really survival heroes. But some bacteria are kind of badass. So not all bacteria are superheroes, some are really bad. But still, we can have very fruitful enzymes in them. This is Staphylococcus aureus, or a kind of visual present representation of Staphylococcus aureus. And Staphylococcus aureus is a bacterium that you can find uh, in hospitals. And it's a very nasty germ, because it easily kills patients. But we as humans cannot really easily kill it. So it kills, but it's hard to kill. Um, but one protein that's called alpha hemolysine has a hole in the middle. And Staphylococcus aureus became kind of a revolution of helpful proteins. So even if the organism is nasty, the proteins can be very helpful. This hole gives it a specific function so that you can integrate into membranes. And like in a molecular tunnel, you can pass molecules from one side to the other. So in this molecular tunnel, researchers have now managed to pass DNA in, or pass DNA through. And by this, we can now make your hand form size devices that can read DNA, investigate DNA, and then help you to understand the genetic code of life all around the globe, all around the world in the habitats, and even on the International Space Station. The historical devices were fridge-sized. Bacteria now managed us to have hand sized devices, which is very, very cool. And back to Staphylococcus aureus being very hard to kill. Yes, it's a supervillain bacterium, but we also have superhero bacteria, right? So um, one of the superhero bacteria that can actually um, defend against Staphylococcus aureus is Chromobacterium violaceum. And as the name suggests, it produces a violet compound. This violet compound is called violacin, looks a little bit like indigo from the chemical structure. And it has much interesting properties because it can, for example, kill Staphylococcus aureus. Or it can also is used to look at how it can kill cancer cells or stuff like that. So it's very, very cool. But even if it has no medical application after we've done our research properly, it still shows us that we as chemists do not need high energy high temperature, and environmental pollution. The dye and pigment industry in the last year pushed 40,000 tons of toxic waste into the environment. And while at that time we have bacteria living in the ocean producing colorful molecules without high temperature, without high pressure, without toxics, and also without environmental pollution. They even decrease environmental pollution. Chromobacterium violaceum can take parts from oil spills and break down tar particles, etc. And this is very scientific now. So I want to start with something easier now, with test matrices. And this is actually the loveliest part about Chromobacterium violaceum. The bacteria only produce the colorful compounds, their colorful world, when they are together. So they have two enzymes that regulate the productions, and they synchronize themselves with molecules we call autoinducers. And you can understand it as being chemical test matrices and synchronizes exchange between bacteria. And if we see and look at this world, it is just so vast that we can hardly grasp it. So we need something to understand this world, and we are very bad at that. Because we may see bacteria under the microscope, but the things that run inside bacteria, the chemistry, are often too tiny to be seen. They're smaller than light. They're literally unseen, or you cannot even see them. They are even quantum systems and obey quantum rules. And that is why we often now try to need with computer. We try to compare computers with microscopes, compare data, etc. And we really hope that quantum computers in the future help us, for example, to understand quantum systems, like those enzymes that do the photosynthesis or the nitrogen fixation. Photosynthesis is something that we humans haven't managed yet, so that would be nice if we could do that. And the other thing, nitrogen fixation, that our little cyanobacteria here can do, is something we also spend tons of energy every time and every year on. 2% of the global energy budget just comes because we need fertilizers and we need to do this one chemical reactions that we do in high pressure tanks, high temperature, while cyanobacteria do it without anything, right? So we should really learn from them. And at the moment, quantum computers are in a very 
small stage, so we need to, to grow this technology, understand it better, and then we can maybe um, unravel the mysteries of bacteria. Until then, we have a little bit of machine learning and a little bit of other biotechnological tools on our side. And one thing that I really want to like praise here is that in the last year computers have learned to fold proteins, which is really, really cool. So I can take a protein that I really favor, for example, M-cherry, which is a very bright reddish fluorescent protein that you can put into cells, and take just the letter jungle of the amino acids that I can easily get in the laboratory and pass it to my computer, and over the cloud it now gives me a free day structure in one hour. And in the laboratory, if people try to find a protein from a genetic code and deduce the structure, it takes them multiple years. So we now speed up our access to how we can define function and form, and it accelerates a lot of research areas at the moment, which is very cool. And everybody in research, especially me as a young person, is excited about that. And we are so happy that people also try to make everything more accessible nowadays. Everything in science is often behind closed doors, especially high-value papers or magazines or whatever, with very good results, and we cannot really easily access them. But the people who are behind this AlphaFold algorithm have published everything on GitHub. So I now can just go, like, lay down on my couch, take out my computer, and do some chemistry. That's really cool. And yeah, that's, that's so nice. So I think we should all support like, this evolution of open science more and try to understand and collaborate more. All over the world, we have Pokemon collections that want to give us more insights and data. And together with computers, we can really, really do that, right? So biology and technology will go more and more together. And one day, we will even find, like, use cases where we can just take bacteria with us maybe on a spaceship and have them provide energy. There are even batteries that are made with bacteria at the moment. They're not high efficient yet, but maybe they will be in the future. And this makes my microbiology a field that goes far beyond only logic and code, because there is community. Every time I kiss somebody, I exchange millions of bacteria. Every time I eat something, bacteria in my gut help me to provide me with energy, with vitamins, with nutrients. They even produce compounds that make me happy. So the thing is, we don't even have to look in the lab. Um, we have to look at our bodies. We are part bacteria. About half my cells are bacteria, and, and only not my genes, my DNA, but also the DNA of bacteria work every day for me. And this may sound very creepy, like being part of a zombie or something like that, but actually bacteria are more similar to humans than you may think. You can try it out. If you have maybe some kind of yogurt bacteria lying around in the laboratory, or if you don't, just trust me, um, you can just give them lactose-free milk and they will be very happy. Because then they don't have to do all this stuff of breaking down the milk sugar by themselves, but they get free sugar, free glucose. They also want just to chill out sometimes. So yeah, I can totally relate with that. And the coolest thing is they like good food. So look in your kitchen and you will find bacteria since centuries living there, helping us to produce good bread, good yogurt, good cheese, good sauerkraut and other really lovely things. Um, if I look at my kitchen counter, um, I always see my pet. So this is my pet, and it's um, actually millions of pets. It's a sourdough. And it helps us as a human culture to make this magic of bread happening every day since centuries. And if somebody now gave, asked me the question like, what would I describe as the perfect survival code? Or what would I think is the answer why bacteria survive so good? Is that I don't know, and I also don't know, and I have not figured my life out yet. But what I know is that there are four things that I really think are so cool that I want to implement them into my life more often. The first is um, explore well-being handle. By keeping my eyes and my mind open, I can look so much more interested at different things and dig so much deeper into topics that I maybe did not care about previously, but now can care about. We often think about these really huge ideas, but when we only think about the big things, we often overlook the tinier ones. And this is where I see a lot of innovation and spark actually happening. So if you find the ideas where Spark comes from, you then have to implement it. And to deploy something, we need to go from an idea to really taking steps of action. But each action takes energy, and by nature, we want to decrease energy. So try out and find your routines, your tasks, your actions, your stuff that helps you to find your personal enzymes that lower activation energy. For me, it's just start. Like, my enzyme is just start. Um, but for you, it may be something different. But we really need to start. And one thing that I also learned is, I can start wherever I am. Bacteria did not travel around the world to find the perfect environment, the perfect whirlpool, whatever. They started where they are and became superheroes of their own environment. They take trash and make it into pigments. 
And I can take hard times and hard challenges and resolve them into me mental strength, mental stamina and resilience. The last thing is community matters. We are one community, we all have our problems, but together we can do so many things. When we work together and we explore together and we make ideas and innovation happen in an environment where we can feel safe and grow those safe ecosystems, the world just becomes a much better place. Because if we are around uplifting people, it's just uplifting for all of us too, right? And together we can really see the unseen things, do the unstunned stuff, and then also know the unknown that's hiding everywhere. And I just beg you to start sometimes with the tiny things that hide in mud, because I don't want the period to wait all too long to be discovered. Thank you.